So let's get started. Uh, good afternoon, KubeCon. You know, I'm Somik Behera here. I'm head of products at a company called Cloudnatix. Spent last 20 years in the armpit of infrastructure, as you know it, in the, and in the open source space, starting with being an early engineer in virtualization at VMware to creating software-defined networking at a company called Nicera. Uh, created an open source project called Neutron, which was a subsystem of networking for uh, OpenStack. And then created the data center operating system as commercial product based on the Apache Mesos project. Um, but today I'm not here to talk about technology, but something rather more dear to my heart based on my experience on these years working in you know, technology, as well as more recently in the cloud native space. And that is, how do you make the business case for the technology? How do you make it cross the chasm? How do you actually push it forward in your organizations, right? So, you know, uh, how can we help justify the value that we bring to the table, not just implement? And finally, how do we measure the value we are providing after we implement and close the loop, close the feedback loop. We, we did what we were saying we were gonna do, and we show that we did it, and then finally close that loop, right? How do you do that? And I believe as cloud native crosses the chasm, it becomes imperative on the community, on all of us, that we enable the t-shirts to speak to the suits, right? The DevOps folks to be able to speak to the finance and the, the line of business executives to actually make people understand why we do this. And I hope today we, I can give you one of the tools in your toolkit that will help you do just that. Right. So we can start with kind of the agenda why, um, then the how part of it, and then what, we'll do a demo of what this toolkit is and how you can use it, and how we can actually participate and all, all make it better together. Right. So let me start with something, um, why FinQ? Right? Because there's a quote that uh, struck a car with me is, uh, that says, no one will pay you what you're worth, right? No one will ever pay you what you're worth. They will only pay you what they think you're worth or your project is worth. Uh, and the good news here in that quote is, uh, you or we can control that thinking. If you, if you, if you set it up the context uh, correctly, you have that control. If you don't, then you have, it's a lost opportunity, right? Um, so who wants to get paid more over here? Me, there you go. More, lots of us, we can take a lot of these lessons and apply it to our, our regular lives. I'm gonna focus really on cloud native and what it means to control the thinking on actually um, moving on a cloud native project, if you have a non cloud native, non Kubernetes infrastructure, how do you make a case for that? But the, some of the primitives or some of the concepts we'll talk about applies everywhere. So there is something in it for everyone. You know, if you're a technologist, you're an engineer or not. Uh, <clears throat> so the way you control that thinking um, is by clearly defining and communicating the value. You have defined the rules of the game. This is, this is why, why it is important and how it's important, a priori, and then communicate it properly so that we are aligned on what are we doing and how we're pro driving that value. And if we don't do that, right, we're gonna see more of this. This, uh, kind of two articles that showed up in last week. <laughs> I was just looking, it's like, yeah, we're, we've done all this work, um, it's not useful, uh, eff effectively, um, and that is, uh, Kind of a mis that's where the objective is misguided because you know some projects, some companies clearly didn't define their objectives and didn't communicate the value. Right? People say it's not worthwhile. It's it's a, or or the, uh, worse yet, you go go on a failure mode for the project. So so that's the high level. Objective, we want to clearly define and communicate value. Um, taking the next step, so how do we do that for 
things we care about in this community is to help Kubernetes and cloud native in general, Kubernetes in specific, cross the chasm and become kind of standardized infrastructure layer. Um, and I'll start that with, with the journey I, I hope our users take. We have a set of tools in, in the community. Uh, a lot of folks here, have, uh, folks here have heard of the landscape project or landscape.cncfio. It's great, it's good for discovery. You go and discover uh, the specific tools you need in your uh, toolkit to implement a specific use case initiative or a project. And then we jump directly to implementing those, right? To uh, get, getting dirty with uh, Terraform or whatever installable you have, and then the YAML files for modernizing the applications, et cetera. Um, and then of course, the, once you have implemented it, all the challenges which most of the folks in this, and the solutions exchange in the, in the sessions here talk about is how do you operate and optimize and keep the lights running, right? Um, we, keep, we keep jumping the loop, but what we miss is that uh, opportunity in between um, kind of discovering and implementing, which is justifying and defining what are we doing, why we're doing, how we will we'll measure success, so that when we actually operate and optimize, everybody, you get the credit that you deserve for what you did. Uh, and that's what I hope uh, FinCube fills the gap. And to better understand the toolkit I'll talk about, we need to have we need to talk about a little bit basics of pricing and how people think of value and uh, how they communicate. Right? It's this is a rough hierarchy kind of. I, I framed it as you know in the order of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of pricing, if you will. Right? The base layer starts with cost. You add up all the cost for your Kubernetes project, people, hardware, cloud, um, you know, time. You add that cost, and that's, that's, a, that's the easiest way to say this is what it costs. That's how people communicate value, which is not the right way necessarily, but the, it is the easiest way because you can do math. A lot of us are engineers. It's easy, and this is what it costs. Um, and if somebody's a business, selling that, they will say that, okay, we'll add a margin on top of that cost, and that's our business. Unfortunately, internal companies, internal teams, tech ops teams, DevOps teams, IT ops teams, just add up the cost, and then people view as not a value creator, but as a cost center that needs to be reduced and optimized, um, in fact, and not as a value creator, because of the model how we can define and communicate our value again, right? So the easiest way to take the next step would be think of a value-based pricing or value of the Kubernetes project that you're bringing, on, uh, bringing to your company, the different kind of objectives, and I'll talk about that in the toolkit. Um, specifically, uh, if you look at the value-based pricing, it talks about not the cost, but what it's doing for the, uh, for the company, is how it's making it efficient, how it's making developers more productive, so if you can release more software faster, what does it mean to your business's top line? How is it ma making the infrastructure more available? So typically, you know, a single outage costs about $300,000 an hour on an average company, maybe different for your company. So if you shave off 10% of that, that's $30,000 an hour, multiply with number of outages you have, there you have another vector, that the kind of availability vector and that, that's monetized, right? That would be a way to communicate the value that you're driving versus the cost you're optimizing. And really, our, my hope is as, you, as folks start using that terminology and go from just being a cost center to a value creator, we can move to the next step, which I call, I call true price, meaning not only the value you're creating for your company, but all the impact you're having based on that, how you're having the sustainability impact. Uh, because things are more efficient, uh, what is the environmental impact? And what is a, really a true price of that initiative? Not only price in terms of dollars, not only per price in terms of value, but in price in terms of the whole of the uh, environment and everybody else that participates in the ecosystem, right? So that's what, where we would like to go, but what, where we are is very much a cost center, cost focused area. Uh, crawl, walk, run approach would be, let's, what if we can just move to the next step? and talk in terms of the value you provide in front of, instead of the amount we cost. <clears throat> so with that, um, let me introduce to you the, uh, the toolkit. Um, uh, 
you can go to fincube.io and get a lot of the resources, the GitHub repositories, everything else today. It consists of three things, and I'll demo that to you. Once, uh, today it's just a plain, uh, kind of an ROI calculator. It's an Excel sheet with like eight different sheets, uh, very MVP-ish, uh, so we can get started and expose people to the idea and see how folks use and what the feedback is. Once you do that, you get your uh, ROI for, a, for one use case, which is moving from a non-Kubernetes, non-cloud native infrastructure to a Kubernetes cloud native application architecture. And based on that, it'll say is what is what is the potential perceived impact for certain size clusters, for infrastructure efficiency, for developer productivity, and for infrastructure application availability, right? And it'll have the hypothesis or assumptions I have made, but because it's open source, you can customize that model, which you know, which may, may better fit your company if you don't agree or doesn't work, the standard model doesn't work for you. Out pops like the graphs and charts you can you can show to make that business case based on that three objectives I mentioned out, efficiency, developer productivity, infrastructure availability, right? And then you have a very poor man's toolkit or poor man's a way of very quick and dirtily making the business case of why you want to move forward with this project. Um, so that's the first two legs. The third leg will be a set of test cases or things you want to accomplish to prove out. So first two are hypothesis, like this is how much your infrastructure efficiency will increase, this is how much your developer will be more productive, this is how much my outages will go down, it's like great, now I'm doing the project, maybe I did a pilot or a POC or a small scale. What are the things we are measuring? What are the metrics we're measuring? And that's how we put in our you know, test plan or a POC plan and, and see you know, before Kubernetes and after Kubernetes. What is the mean time to resolution? Or what is the number of builds or uh, you know, um, releases shipped per quarter per day? Uh, and then you can kind of close that loop in a very quantitative, in a very logical way. Because once you have the numbers, it's, it's very, very clear what was before and what was after, and what actually got delivered. And sometimes, you know, we mis mistakes happen, you'll make an hypothesis, and it'll probably, may not be 100% right. But at least you have the framework to now um, continuously improve that model. Um, so without further ado, let's head over to, give me a second, <clears throat> to fincube.io and uh, the mirror my displays, and I can give you a live uh, demo of the toolkit. Okay. So you can go to the fincube.io. The first thing you know, you can. You can Subscribe for updates to Toolkit. You can join the Slack channel to give feedback or go to GitHub if you want to kind of make changes or file issues. But I'll just go to the uh, resources tab, which will open up a kind of a shared Google Drive. I have the license files in there as kind of Apache 2. You guys can use it as, as you wish uh, and modify it. <coughs> the first piece is uh, the ROI calculator that I mentioned. It's got instructions, make a copy for yourself. The first tab of this is pretty simple. The ones, the columns that are highlighted are all you need to fill out. Now, all the other knobs you can, you know, it's like the advanced user mode and hopefully over time I make uh, more kind of a blog post on how to use that. Um, you can talk about your project name, use case. Today we have only one use case which is moving to Kubernetes from a non-Kubernetes infrastructure future, we can talk about automation, application delivery, you know, make more cloud native application services, other use cases as well. Talk about how large of your project you're talking, tiny 10 node cluster, you know, small 100 node, medium node, etc. Let's do 1000 node cluster. <coughs> and you can talk about, uh, you know, what size of VMs or nodes you're using. And, uh, without Kubernetes. And our assumption is that because it's an intelligent cluster manager, we should be able, and not only assumption, we have seen it in the industry, is that you can use larger nodes and bin pack more services in lesser number of nodes. So you can talk about, you know, uh, what are your ideal 
the size of Kubernetes nodes you will go to from your non-Kubernetes node and expected current expected utilization, you can look up at your actual number, so you know, whatever it is, and 9% what I have while it looks low, it's very much within industry standard. If you go into any environment, you see maybe 20, 15, 20% on some companies, but really it's in that, and you can make the assumption you'll increase, it increases by 2x or 3x, and this is based on real life experience, what I've seen in some of the studies um, folks have done. It's about two to three x uh, utilize, net utilization increase, you see. Uh, forget requests and limits, but really the raw utilization number if you look at the operating system level. And here you're making, it goes from 9% to 27%, right? Uh, everything else, you can see uh, how it computes on how many developer sal DevOps salaries, developer salaries, et cetera, customizable, um, and that's it. And the rest, the next step is you go to the cover sheet and it gives you the graphs to, you know, have your first point of view, or your straw man on a business case on operational efficiency, developer productivity, and kind of application availability. Um, how much you're going to save before Kubernetes and after Kubernetes. So once you have this, if you want to customize it, of course, you can go to all these tabs for, which have details for each one of this. Now, value drivers, if you will, right? So you can customize all the assumptions I made around before Kubernetes and after Kubernetes, but that's kind of the advanced mode, player mode, if you will. So for most folks, this should be sufficient. You have the initial uh, use case. We'll, we'll take questions at the end. Um, and then you go back to uh, the FinQ project the business case, and it's got a template kind of a presentation where based on the numbers you're in New York environment, you calculate it, you put in for each one of the uh, objectives, what do you expect the return or the impact will be, right? And you can paste in the uh, graphs and make why you think those will, you know, sometimes these are the points of why you'll make that impact will be custom to your company or your application, or how much, how critical downtime is, or what is the real true cost of your downtime, et cetera, right? And uh, once you have that, you can you know, show the summary of your total Kubernetes project, your operational efficiency impact, developer productivity impact, and your reliability or application availability, outage reduction impact, and that should give you uh, if, if not everything, a very good, strong, foundational straw man to make that business case internally, right? Of why you want to take on that uh, Kubernetes use case. So with that, <clears throat> and I promise we'll have, I think we'll have plenty of time for Q&A, or a little time at least. Uh, once you, and with that, you know, that is kind of the foundation of uh, to FinQ, you guys can go ahead, try it, pretty low bar to entry. You know, if you want, you can create macros and other things. And, uh, but for most folks, you can just get started. It's like Excel and PowerPoint. And, uh, and the reason I started with an MVP of an Excel and PowerPoint is because the, the roadmap or the thinking is that what does community think and how people use and which pieces are confusing and which is valuable. Imagine it being a V1 beta. Uh, spend six to nine months, uh, get that feedback and, you know, see which things should be kind of pre-populated or which should be in like the easy player mode and which should be in advanced player mode to get that uh, feedback and then make it, you know, call it GA and expand to more use cases. Like what is a, uh, can, I, can I do a similar, you know, turnkey easy business case for application delivery or for some other kind of use cases, which is additional value beyond moving to Kubernetes. Uh, that it can do. And once we have that kind of uh, bootstrap, we can of course make it like a web app. Um, that's the way landscape.cncf.io is, based on community interest, how many people want to do it, who wants to work on it, et cetera. Uh, it's probably easier once we have this working in uh, just a non-code or Excel code working, uh, we can move it to like a web app code so people can self-serve and, and becomes a easy to use business casing toolkit. Not only for Kubernetes, a lot of these principles are beyond Kubernetes. So if you're starting an open source project 
or you're starting a company or product, you can use these same principles and should be able to build up a pricing plan of how you want to show why your thing is worth something or what is, this, what is the impact it's having, right? So that's the thinking on the roadmap. Um, so to s quickly summarize um, what we went through, you know, let we, you have to clearly define and communicate value to make your project successful. You need to intercept the journey early and do that, build that definition early, as early in the journey as possible. To, to ensure that you set up the company, set up the, the project for success. Second, join the FinCube community, try it out, give feedback, use it, and that's how you, know, you will provide value to your company and to the community, and we can upstream this back to the masses that everybody else can leverage that uh, selective uh, experiences of each one of us so that we can actually make technology, the cloud native uh, movement, a lot more mainstream as we cross the chasm, as we go into larger companies and uh, more bigger initiatives. <clears throat> and finally, that's how you become a hero and you know get promoted, right? So uh, that's, that's how I had a, how I had a top level. Uh, I think we have plenty of time to uh, take questions. Uh, so I'll go ahead and open up the floor uh, for questions, and for once the questions we don't cover, I will be at the booth SU84 uh, on the show on the show floor, Cloud Natives booth, to answer from there. Hi, thank you. Um, I really like the way that you quantify uh, some of the advantages with Kubernetes on a like a numbers based level. Uh, I think that's really important. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to the calculation of the value for um, improved developer velocity. I saw you had on one slide. Um, and then a minor point of suggestion, I believe the graphs for costs with and without Kubernetes, the legends are reversed on the first two graphs, which makes it seem like Kubernetes increases costs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The colors were right, but the but the, the placement of the uh, bar was was reversed. That's, that's yeah. good feedback. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I was um, I was wondering if you could speak to the um, developer productivity. Yes. Yeah. So it's hard uh, to quantify, at least as yeah. I understand it. Yeah. Why don't I quickly go back? Uh, so I went really quick. So uh, there is a lot more to it. So if you go to second tab. It talks about uh, developer productivity with and without Kubernetes and every stage of the, the application development journey when you, you can do more with less because you have a programmatic infrastructure. This assumes you have non-Kubernetes infrastructure, probably not even containerized on microservices. So if you're doing application definition or builds, it just takes more work. Uh, once you have a Kubernetes infrastructure, it, it talk, the line items will talk about the number of hours saved. And the overall high-level message, without going to weeds, here is that um, you can ship more builds, more releases in less time. Uh, and that equa equals to making more progress for the business, therefore more features out in the market, and therefore you know, for every expensive developer you, <laughs> we, all the companies pay for who are in short supply, you're actually making them more efficient. Uh, and that's how the value is coming for, you know, if I make, if I pay a developer $100,000, make them 10% efficient, that's $10,000 in value, right? And here is make them three times more as efficient, that's like 300,000. Uh, so that's the basic premise of the calculation. Uh, good question, thank you. Uh, any other question? I have a question up here. Hello, I was wondering what the basis of just by taking an application and dropping it into a Kubernetes cluster increases efficiency. What's the basis of that? So um, the basis of efficiency is, uh, you know, traditionally uh, COTS, commercial off the shelf, or traditional virtual machine based applications, which were non-containerized, non-cloud uh, native, or uh, 
which are applications were black boxes. Um, so it was hard to multiplex multiple applications on, this, on, the, on the same set of uh, pool of cluster nodes, uh, same set of pool of har uh, hardware. Uh, so the, the core premise is that once you go to a clustered system, beat anything, before it was Mesos, Docker Swarm, um, and I'm talking about Kubernetes because it has become the de facto standard, uh, and uh, you know, it's like dial tone. But once you go to a clustered uh, cloud native system, uh, because you can multiplex multiple of uh, apps, therefore, you know, you're, you can basically bin pack it a little better. Okay, so the basis is from COT applications that expect to own the entire VM yeah. to containerized. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That could be a problem because most commercial applications are not delivered or don't support running in containers yet. Correct, and that's why here you'll have a business case as this is why you should probably need to do at least that much work. Yeah, and that's If I the do the work, is it, it yeah. worthwhile? And, okay. and, that's, and that's a question we have seen a lot of uh, users and customers like, yeah, I know it will be useful, but I'm gonna to have to spend a month containerizing, and this is a way you can kind of preempt that question. I'm like, this is clear uh, uh, value, and that there's a clear cost, now, now let's decide. Uh, should we do it, or, or maybe so for some of them it doesn't make sense, but at least you'll have a baseline to make that decision. Thanks. Um, any other question? Oh, I think we have a couple of more minutes. Well, I can take I've got one. Oh, there's one. two more questions over there. Hi, my name is Lily, I'm with KubeCost. I had a question just regarding ongoing validation for Kubernetes. So this seems like a really great tool for at least making the first initial business case to executive stakeholders, but what happens once you have Kubernetes in production, you have different application use cases, how would you view FinCube as a tool to then further continue to validate ongoing projects over time? Uh, thanks. So the question was that, uh, you know, uh, from this lady from KubeCast, uh, how do we uh, validate on an ongoing basis um, the value delivered? So what I uh, showed FinCube as, uh, as a toolkit early in the journey of moving to a cloud native architecture from discovery to justification to implementation. But once you do that, you have to operate and optimize. And there's an ecosystem of FinOps tooling and FinOps and cloud and capacity and availability optimization tooling, which all of us observability tooling, which you have to deal with. Uh, and I, that was not the focus, it's not the focus of FinCube because uh, there is plenty of uh, work there, plenty of uh, commercial and open source tooling there, what uh, folks should and can leverage, you know, um, to kind of continuously operate, continuously optimize and keep, keep their uh, infrastructure optimized and be able to kind of report back, close the loop. But yeah, FinCube's really focusing on early in the life cycle, how do you, how do you set the rules of the game? Yeah. Another question for the lady over there? Uh, okay. Uh, if, okay, if there is no other question, um, you know, please take a moment to leave, leave us any feedback, appreciate it, join the FinCube community. And if you have more questions, if you have more feedback, come find me at the SU84 booth. Happy to talk about FinCube, FinOps, and what should we do next. Thank you.